Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. If you are so inclined, use the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm in Seattle. Laura and Laurel are in Milan. Which sounds kind of nice right now. Where are you? And how is your Sunday? We'll let a few more people get logged in before we start. All right. Looks like we're leveling off there, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington called Book Larder. And we are just starting up with some of our in-person cooking classes and just a very few author events um, in the shop. Um, but we are continuing to do um, so many of our author talks here on Zoom. And um, the wonderful thing about that is that we get to have conversations like the one today where I'm in Seattle and our authors are in Italy and people tuning in are all over the place. So thank you so much for joining us today. Today's talk is being recorded as well, and so it will be posted to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. We'll send out a notification to everyone who registered for this to let them know it's available so that you can watch it again or share it with friends if you would like. So we are going to talk about Italian food today with Laurel Evans and Lara Lazzaroni from authors of Liguria and the new Cucina Italiana. Um, so excited about both of these books. Um, I've been completely immersed in books that have allowed me to sort of armchair travel as we have all lived through the past 18, 19 months. Um, and I think these two books have really uh, been a wonderful part of sort of taking me on a culinary and sort of mental journey, an, an intellectual one, I guess, um, as we all sort of stay home more than usual. Um, Laurel and Lara are going to do an actual demonstration for us today. So they're going to make the chestnut gnocchi they are going to of course talk about all things italian cuisine and answer your questions so if you have questions please use the q a button at the bottom of your screen to ask those i'll keep an eye on them and so if you have a question about something that they're doing as they do the demo or whatever feel free to ask those and i'll sort of chime in to make sure um, that your questions get answered both of the books are, of course, available at booklarder.com, and you can support the author talk by choosing to um, purchase the books from us if you are doing that. Um, I know many of you have already, so thank you for that. I will put links to both of them in the chat um, so that you can find those there. All right, so without further ado, let's welcome Laurel Evans and Laura Lazzaroni. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, guys. So thank you for having us. Um, so we're tuning in from Milan, and we're very excited to be here. Uh, we're going to uh, demo one of Laurel's dishes where, from her new book, Liguria, where I'll be the little helper, and she'll be the one who's cooking. Um, but, you know, before we start talking about Italian cuisine, which is obviously a super broad uh, subject and one that is particularly dear to our hearts, we just wanted to introduce ourselves a little bit and, and tell you um, also all about uh, how we met because we actually go way back and we've been friends for many years and we work together on more than one occasion. Um, Wait, first we should put our faces, our names to the to the yeah. books because wait, I'm Laurel. This is mine. <laughs> and I'm well. Laura, and this is mine. It's a little confusing because our names are really similar. And we're also dressed alike. We we're just trying to um, mix this, things and up. And it was not set up before, but we we typically do this. We'll show up at events and we'll be basically wearing the same thing. Um, so, uh, funnily enough, actually, we first met at Vogue, the magazine. Um, I was coming back from uh, five years in New York and Laurel 
uh, was already here in Italy, uh, where she moved many, many years ago from Texas, and she's going to tell you about that. It was my first job. Uh, it was in yep. Vogue, and I was working in the graphic design department, and I heard someone speaking impeccable English out in the hallways, <laughs> and I was like, oh, who is this person? And so I met Laura, fortunately, <laughs> yes. and forged a, a decades-long friendship. Absolutely. I was working at Luomo Vogue, uh, where I became features editor. Um, so we were really uh, doing anything that had to do with food then even though it was our passion already um and uh, you know i was basically doing all the newsy stuff in the magazine but especially uh covering the you know restaurants and chefs uh, um but not doing cookbooks yet and and neither was laurel but then fortunately at one point we left and we started doing it and and writing books and working with food more hands-on which is really our passion um, and then uh, a few years later, actually, we found um, us working together once again on another food related About project. 10 years later, I yeah, think. Totally. So we kind of lost touch for a while, went our own separate ways, both ended up in food. And then one day, Laura calls me up. She says, Hey, I'm working on this cool new project. We're going to do food and wine, Italia. Would you like to come on board and be part of it? And of course, I said yes. <laughs> yes. And so we, you know, we launched the Italian edition of Food and Wine. I was the editor in chief. And Laura was a food editor, um, and uh, and that's where you know the ball started rolling again for the two of us, and that led us to working first actually on this book together because I wrote the book and researched it, but Laura tested all the recipes, and she's a food editor of this book as well. And, and she, if we survived that project together, <laughs> our, our friendship can survive anything. No, it was it was so much fun, but it was really uh a super intense such an exciting project to be part of i got to talk to yeah. all of the best chefs in italy today and learn firsthand about their recipes right. and so right. it was it was so much fun and yeah. then she really encouraged me after that project to stop talking about it and actually send out a proposal for my own cookbook which i had been thinking about writing wanting to write for years and years and she really I kind of kicked my butt and said, go for it, just do it, you can do this, get over your imposter complex and move I mean, on. <laughs> honestly, she just basically had to press like download and download all the information that she already had in her brain. She had been, yeah. you know, her, her husband is Italian from Liguria and she's been going to the beautiful yet relatively under the radar region for so many years and I will say that she knows it probably better than most Italians mm. I know mm. so yes so the cool thing about these two books so which obviously are different books and we'll get a little bit more into you know what they are and what they cover um is that they do have uh, something in common that's very strong which is that each from their own angle and point of view they tackle that's a less known side of Italy, right? Like in the case of Liguria, you're certainly um, unveiling to the world of the, this gorgeous region that, that not many people know outside. A of lot of dishes that even people within Liguria, who, you know, Liguria is a very long and narrow region. So people from the very Western tip don't know a lot of the recipes that are from the Eastern tip. And so even people from within Liguria don't know a lot of these dishes. Totally. And so, you know, a less known regional Italy, which is a fantastic and really deserves to be, you know, told to the world and discovered. So come to Italy and come to the Guria. And also a less known um, side of uh, Italy on the restaurants side of Italy with my book, which is a basically journey from north to south, uh, um, going, you know, to the restaurants of these young chefs, new league, of Italian restaurateurs, all very young women and men who are trying to bring something new to the table um, and, and moving past tradition respectfully, obviously, so retaining what's good and also adding their own personal touches and uh, um, something contemporary that is super fun and exciting from, you know, fine dining all the way to the new trattorie. So this is, I think, super cool about the two books so that in a way they complement each other, right? Because Well, something that I think you, you need to also say about your book, honestly, I mean, it totally schooled me about the state of contemporary <laughs> Italian cuisine. No, honestly, because it's something that I found fascinating was how you categorized all these new emerging chefs who I would go to the restaurant and be like, wow, this is really good. This is really exciting. But I didn't exactly know why 
or which trend they fell in. And you, the, the way you broke your book up into different chapters that, that explained the trend, where it came from, where it's going, who's oh, there right yeah, now. She's selling my book, basically. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it was, it was a, a big education yeah. for me. Well, because the thing is that, and, but then I really wanna jump in, into Liguria. So but the thing about um, Italian cuisine and, and really the perception of Italian cuisine that kind of brought me to you know, writing the book and, pitching the proposal and then writing the book is that um, it's it's kind of like a, is a, has fallen victim to its own um, status of world icon in gastronomy, right? So it's untouchable basically. And it's also unmovable in the perception that people have of it where basically all over the world, it's either associated with the something super conceptual or very, very, you know, fine dining style like Massimo Bottura's beautiful cuisine, which is fantastic, but not for everybody, or incredibly traditional, you know, down home moms and pops uh, fare like cacio e pepe, carbonara, and, and tortellini in brodo, which are again fantastic. No one's ever gonna touch them, don't worry. But my point was that, well, I mean, it's fine, but in between those two, extremes so there's like a whole new world that's exploding and has been building up there's a huge range in contemporary italian cuisine and it's still delicious it still can be still very comforting obviously the flavors are all there and even the iconic dishes there's lots of pastas of course then and you know and risotto and beautiful gnocchi which we're going to talk about later from both uh, uh, sides um but there's also these young chefs who are trying to reimagine the experience of the restaurant. So, you know, they're working on the Neo Trattoria or the new fine dining open to everyone or, you know, uh, opening restaurants and farms. And so Laura was saying the categories, yes, in the book you'll find, well, the mentors of who are the ones that everyone's looking up to and they're still very young. Um, and then there's the farmers and foragers uh, uh, the, the voices of the neo Osteria and neo trattorie and Osteria and Trattoria are two different things. Uh, you know, the new fine dining stars and the, the Sunday restaurateurs. Uh, um, so it's, it's, a, it's really, it's a whole new world that shouldn't scare anyone because it's, uh, again, super delicious and, and welcoming, but fun and surprising. So I wish everybody could come and discover it. Absolutely. And, and I think that, I mean, this book is not only a cookbook full of really amazing recipes, but it's also like um, Laura was saying earlier, it's a great armchair traveling book. I mean, you can really lose yourself in there. Yeah. And it reads like a novel. So. Well, thanks. So, like, that's, a, that, that's the style of writing and we can both go into it a little bit more later because we both have our own personal style and, and it's fun to sort of find new ways to approach cookbook writing. And I think we both had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. So you can definitely use my book as a cookbook, but also use it just to know these new voices or also to travel you know, through um, sort of less known regions like Borges Abruzzo, for instance, or Friuli Venezia Giulia. And then there's another fantastic region that I really want to talk about, but one you to school me, since you said, okay. I'm sorry, that's not true that I schooled you with my book, <laughs> but Absolutely. so like, what should people know about Liguria if you had to break it down and like its fundamentals of someone who doesn't even know right. what is there? Well, I think something particular about Liguria, let me, I actually should use a teaching aid for this because um, the geography of Liguria is incredibly important in order to understand the region. So I don't know if there's a bad glare. So we are surrounded by some of the most famous eating destinations on the planet. We have France over here, Piemont over here, Emilia Romagna, Tuscany. The, the flavors and the traditions from all those different regions are surrounding Liguria. And not that Liguria is taking from them necessarily, but Liguria is no less of a incredibly valid eating destination with its own deep, deep roots than any of those places. And I think it's uh, a shame that it's not better known. You know, people come to Liguria for Cinque Terre, for Portofino, sometimes they go to Genoa but nobody 
so far really comes to Liguria for the food. And that is uh, a huge shame because yeah. you know, we, we, we have a lot so to offer. Much. People know, and the people even within Italy, people don't really know about Ligurian cuisine. People know pesto and focaccia. And we're not talking about two dishes that are kind of okay. I mean, we're talking about two world famous, yeah. groundbreaking genius uh, dishes. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more where that comes from. And um, I think Ligurian cuisine is surprising because it's not as sea-based as many people would think. You know, people think, oh, with all that coastline, they must just eat a bunch of fish and pasta and vongole, stuff like that. But mostly Liguria, those dishes are just made for the tourists. The real Ligurian cuisine is land-based, but not so much meat. It was a poor cuisine. You know, there right. wasn't, and there wasn't a lot, it's a very, very hilly region too. And so there wasn't a lot of room to raise cattle or to have big, uh, big farms. And so meat was scarce. Meat was used almost as a flavoring rather than a main part of the, the meal. And in its stead, they would use aromatic herbs, pine nuts, anchovies, other different ways to kind of kick up the umami and all their dishes and to make something feel more hearty and be more hearty without, you know, just throwing a, a big steak or a big roast in the middle of the plate. Right. And I remember you telling me that it sort of like embodies uh, many culinary, um, I hate the word, but I think it's kind of fitting trends uh, that are like super hot right now and rightfully so because they're the way to the future. Like, and it's uh, absolutely, it genius. seems, it seems like a cuisine that like a, a hipster from the West Coast in America would invent and be like, oh, I'm having this, you know, plant based, low waste uh, diet uh, with lots of aromatic herbs. I mean, that's what it, it really feels like because, you know, it's, it's based on no food waste. Every, every dish you make, there's a way to recycle the leftovers in something else. Uh, a good example is the toco. It's a sauce that you make. It's basically kind of a pot roast that you make with a piece of meat in a tomato sauce. The, um, yeah, the, the tomato sauce then becomes the pasta sauce for ravioli, which you make the filling of the ravioli with some of the meat. And then for the second course, you serve the rest of the meat. So this is that oh, dish. So one piece of meat and you, and you, that make this incredibly complex dish right. with um and there's no leftovers so. that's a beautiful photo by the way i'm sorry shouldn't we shout out to the photographer who happens to also be <laughs> your husband you're absolutely right <laughs> but it's i mean who who better than the ligurian uh, son well i think this was this was an especially uh, special project for us because Emilio, my husband, has taken all the pictures for all my books. We worked very close together on the blog, on the articles. I mean, we, we always work closely together on all the food projects, in photo and video. But this project in particular, I think he felt more his as well because Liguria is the region where he is from, where his family is from. So he was really able to put a lot more of himself in it maybe than in some of the other books where I was, you know, like, oh, just change the lighting for the cheesecake, you know? And it wasn't, right. it, it wasn't maybe as, um, he wasn't as involved uh, in a heartfelt way as he was in this project. And so I think that he really, it was important for him to show his love for Liguria and how right. he saw the region when we were selecting the pictures. It was, right. it was a really, a really fun project yeah, to work I on together. I think it comes through all yeah. the love. And also it's a family project. It's not just a husband and wife project. It's a bit, larger than that and like it, the roots well i'm gonna right. start um peeling the potatoes because otherwise we're all over <laughs> finish the gnocchi tonight so what are we dish are we making again? okay so we're making chestnut gnocchi chestnut flour gnocchi so i'm not making it with uh real chestnuts and the reason that chestnut flour is important in liguria is because there were lots of chestnut trees there are lots of chestnut trees and forests and uh, you know there was no big fields again for growing wheat there was not very much wheat available in Liguria. And so a lot of recipes are based on chestnut flour and they often substituted it for wheat flour and used it instead. So chestnut gnocchi served with pesto are a very typical dish from the region. There's no photo in there because it's probably the least photogenic <laughs> dish on the planet. I was uh, <laughs> looking for the picture. They're, you know, little She's brown balls. Like, like they're not, they're not that exciting to see, but, um, but they're very, very delicious and they go wonderfully with pesto. So just one word about the potatoes. I uh, boil them whole in cold water. I put three tablespoons of salt in there 
because they want a lot of salt in the potatoes. And I boil them until they're fork tender. And then I cut them. And when they're still warm, I peel them. So that's why I'm going to start peeling them now. And we can keep on talking. And then I'll show yeah. the rest of the process um, later. Any particular kind of potato? like Russet, russet potatoes okay. or any kind of starchy. Right potato right. works really. oh it's interesting i have to say like this pairing with pesto which is not obvious right because people especially abroad tend to associate pesto to trofie or mm. you know something like a more the neutral flavor yeah in a pasta whereas the chestnut and gnocchi hold their own chestnut and the gnocchi hold their own they're also delicious with just butter and mm. sage and right. parmesan they're right. delicious that way too but no you find it a lot of times with pesto and it actually it, it actually works i know it seems strange because also the the chestnut flour is a little bit sweet and you're like mm, how's that going to work together but it really the the flavors complement each other they don't overpower so right it's nice so um, is this one of the family recipes or one of the... No, this is not necessarily a family recipe. This is more of a traditional recipe that I've eaten a lot in restaurants in Liguria. Right. Again, not the tourist joints you'll find on the seaside, but yeah. the trattorias that are inland, the family, right. the family places. Right. Um, a lot of the recipes, so I guess I should back up. When I moved to Italy 17 years ago, we moved to Milan, my husband and I moved to Milan. And, but he is from Liguria and we would spend, and we still do spend almost every weekend mm -hmm. in Liguria and Monedia, the town where his family is from. Almost every weekend, even in the winter time, even in the off season. And then we would spend, you know, most of our summers there as well. And, you know, I'm not a huge beach goer. I like the beach, but I can't just lay out in the sun all day. I get bored, I get sunburned. It's just not for me. You get antsy. I get antsy. And so I would spend, a whole lot of time I just found myself even before I spoke you know very decent Italian I found myself kind of puttering around in the kitchen with uh, my husband's mother my now mother-in-law and uh, her two sisters that we now refer to as the nonne because they're the matriarchs of the family yep. and they would start cooking in the morning you know they'd plan out in the morning the whole menu for lunch and dinner for the day for however many people were in the house and I just started following them around looking and learning and uh, you know, when I discovered years later that those weren't just Italian recipes, they were typical Ligurian recipes. Like, wow, oh, why don't more people know about these? And, you know, that's where that all started. Well, so the nonna is a very obviously <laughs> important figure um, in Italian cuisine, and naturally home Italian home cooking and, and traditional Italian cuisine. And uh, in a way, you know, the grandmothers play a big role in both books, I have to a say. A big role in both books. I think a bigger one in yours <laughs> because they get slain by the author. No, they don't get slain. <laughs> no, but so because this is one of the That's other- That's an important topic. This is, it's an important topic because remember, we're talking about, in the case of my book, about restaurant cuisine. And uh, so it was important to let people know that um, the grandmothers are, are uh, you know, still a source of information and inspiration for these chefs, uh, but at the same time, they're not stuck in, in time. So they've taken what they could learn from them and what, what worked, and not everything worked. In the case of Laurels and Nonne, of course, they were perfect, uh, but listen, let's keep it real. I mean, many Italian Nonne there were some, you know, even technical scientific uh, pieces of information that they didn't have about how to, you know, treat meat, for instance. And so you would have these like a uh, four day, you know, cooked uh, ragouts that were um, unedible at the end or, or the meat completely denaturated or the one mistake that they would typically make, especially, you know, in certain regions and more than others. Uh, and in the countryside, more than in the cities were to use lots of fat. Uh, because that's what they had been, you know, taught. Um, so what these young chefs are doing is, you know, they're retaining what I call, you know, the quintessentially Italian flavor coding, which is probably the biggest lesson that they've really learned is to identify what ingredients go together and what flavors go together in a way that it's uh, immediately recognizable as uh, an Italian accord. You know, it's like, wow, you can taste it with blindfolded and you know that that sauce or that jus or that particular combination is uh, truly ours. And that I think they know because they've been exposed to it at home, they've been, you know, uh, waking up in the morning, smelling it and eating up, eating it and uh, at home. And so that's one thing. And then obviously there are other things that are 
you know, ingrained, for instance, in the hand gestures, like um, making a really perfect, super thin spoglia. I don't think anyone can make a better spoglia than a spoglina still. But then, you know, there are things that our young chefs have improved on and, and really some of the work that they've been doing uh, everywhere from fine dining to even trattoria is working on uh, um, preserving flavors, actually making them shine through even more while reducing fat and, and making dishes that are lighter while, you know, still being incredibly delicious. Um, and this is one thing that you can really do if your ingredients are supreme quality, if you know how to treat them, how to even, you know, uh, uh, butcher uh, the cut and, and what kind of cooking technique you're supposed to use. And we have to remember that Italian cuisine is a cuisine of simplicity and of the ingredients. I mean, Spanish cuisine, for instance, is a cuisine of, is a technical cuisine and French cuisine is also a more technical cuisine. Italian cuisine is a, truly ingredient driven because our ingredients are so fantastic. So what we learn is to use, you know, as little um, truly um, elements that could interfere with the perception of the flavor and the ingredient as possible. So to make a long story short, uh, the nonne are still <laughs> the stars in one way or the other, even if we're trying to emancipate or, you know, no, I think that's a really good point because yeah. um, I think there there is a tendency in Italy to you know idolize the non and the nonna's cuisine when in fact like you said there there were some technical errors they they just didn't have the access either to yeah. the equipment or yeah. the ingredients or just the know how mm -hmm. to make some things better Absolutely. and so sometimes breaking with these traditions isn't you know blasphemous but it's just necessary in order to create something yeah. a bit better and a little bit new yeah it's also a generation thing I think also because some people I mean I'm not going to say how old we are <laughs> No, but I mean, yeah, they're, you know, young, younger people than us today, their grandmothers probably didn't even cook that much and certainly mm -hmm. not from scratch because they were, you know, of a generation that was working all the time and probably getting ready, you know, stuff ready from the uh, rotisserie or, or opening. Yeah, I mean, not to mention dinners. our generation, there's a, a lot yeah. of Italian women as well now that yeah. don't cook and yeah. uh, they True. prefer not to so so why you i know i have to i have to Sorry. keep going here otherwise i'll never get joking so potato ricer absolutely best piece of equipment to make gnocchi i realize that not everybody has one of these you don't have to you can use a potato masher you can use a fork in a bowl they will be a little bit lumpier this can really make soft fluffy gnocchi whatever you do do not even think about putting them in a food processor you will make glue and you can paste posters on the wall with it so um potato ricer do this one while the potatoes are still warm and i can just kind of put this down like this um do this when the potatoes are still warm just because they'll go through a little bit easier and i don't like to use a bowl i like to do this directly on a work surface so then i sift the flour over it and um and knead it all together because then the bowl gets a little bit can okay, see all those beautiful little fluffy pieces of potato come out. So I'm gonna keep doing this while you keep it talking and entertaining our guests. <laughs> Let me know if I can help you, obviously. I mean, I know that you- Potatoes are peeled. You know, this is actually, well, making gnocchi by hand, it seems like it might be daunting or one of those tasks you're like, oh man, I, I need to have a whole right. Sunday off to do it. It's actually really easy and um, and not that bad. I mean, obviously if you're not making it for a crowd, if you're making it for a crowd, it gets a little bit more intense. So these are easy gnocchi. Then there's another <laughs> dish of oh, gnocchi yeah. from my book actually, which Laurel tested. Mm -hmm. uh, so she knows that recipe well. Um, it's it's a, a recipe, one of my favorite recipes from the book is, is from uh, Antonia Krugman, who's the chef of La Regina Vinco, which is a rest, beautiful restaurant uh, uh, in Friuli, Venezia Giulia, almost uh, on the border with uh, Slovenia. And she makes this fantastic gnocchi with potatoes, red beets, uh, and then they're dressed with um, hibiscus powder, this plum gelatin. Show the picture yes. because they're they're so beautiful they're and gorgeous. and a delicious dish and one that made me insane because I wanted to replicate it perfectly. And Antonia is incredibly exacting as a chef. Yes, I mean she she, she accepts no compromises, yeah. which is what makes her an amazing chef. 
but you know, my job yeah. was to adapt these recipes for the home a home, kitchen. a home cook. And so I'd yeah. be like, oh, is there any other way that we can <laughs> make this? Do yeah. we actually have to have, you know, this extractor? And she was like, no, it has to be made like this. Otherwise it's not the recipe. And I really respect her for that. Because, yeah. Um, but then actually Laurel found a beautiful hack. So you can make these at home as well. And again, absolutely. Russet potatoes and, and small beets, and then um, they're they're dressed with the Jerusalem artichoke chips, which are fantastic because they give almost a chocolatey hint. And then there's the uh, rose uh, hibiscus powder, which give acidity. But the cool thing about the gnocchi is that they perfectly embody uh, what I call the frontier cuisine of Antonia's because she, she is, as I mentioned, on the border of Slovenia, which is where Friuli Venezia Giulia is. And as in all frontiers of the world, obviously, it's a very mixed uh, uh, culinary tradition that brings in, you know, hints and flavors from so, you know, so many different cultures. Uh, um, Eastern Europe, for instance, and part of uh, Antonia's family comes from there. And so one of the uh, um, defining factors of uh, the uh, cucina of Friuli Venezia Giulia is uh, well, uh, this use, large use of, uh, um, of stone fruit, fruit in general, but stone fruit, especially in savory dishes, uh, not just uh, in uh, uh, ravioli. Uh, she has uh, well, the region's most famous dish probably is uh, um, a plum-filled uh, raviolo uh, made with pasta fresca, so egg-based fresh pasta that you then you know, seal with a filling inside. And she makes a beautiful version of that as well, uh, which is one more filled cappelletti in a plum broth. Uh, but these gnocchi also are, are sort of like a, yet another alternative take on that use because of, of the, the gelatin. They have this the gelatin, the plum gelatin that kind of wraps around them. I don't know if you can see them because the photo is small, but it wraps around them and it melts. It's so thin that it melts when it comes in contact with the, the hot gnocchi. And it's really a gorgeous dish. And another gorgeous dish of Antonia is this um, seeds amaranth and sunflower which um, is also symbolic of another of her defining features as a chef, but also of Friuli Venezia Giulia, which is a vegetable-based, plant-based uh, cuisine, definitely. And Antonia especially forages a lot in the wild, in the Valle del Natizone, around her restaurant. Uh, the restaurant itself has a, a large property surrounded by orchards where she grows, um, you know, uh, old varieties of uh, fruits of all kinds and, and her own aromatics. Uh, and then it's surrounded by vineyards too because it's uh, Collio. So it's one of the most famous probably wine regions in Italy. Um, and, uh, and then there's uh, a whole bunch of you know, gorgeous woods and hills and levees where she goes every day on her run uh, to collect uh, wild herbs and, and wild leafy greens that she then uses in her cuisine. But this particular dish here, which always reminds me of grits, the texture really reminds me of grits, is fantastic. But the flavor is so much more intense oh because it tastes God. like seeds. Yes, it tastes like, you know, seeds and, and, and freshly cut grass and- But it's a very satisfying dish. It's very, very hearty at the same time. Very much, it has this nutty roundness mm -hmm. to it. It's, uh, that's why I say it reminds me of Brits. It's uh, delicious, truly, but it's 100% plant-based. So Antonia is one of the fascinating chefs of the new cucina italiana. Um, another fun fact about Antonia, which is what just makes me like her even more is that she, um, she cooks in her mind, which is something that I find a truly unique. So she was very briefly, many years ago, she got into a, a car accident and she was, she had to stay in bed, she was bedridden for a few months and so she couldn't cook. But being a super precise and self-exacting, as Laurel said, she wanted to keep, you know, sort of training and practicing. And so she started basically doing like a sensory exercise like those that you do at like acting school I think mm -hmm. you know imagine an orange and you peel the orange so and she was doing that with uh, with dishes so, you know like imagining all the actions and steps and like peeling and sifting and uh, slicing and dicing and that's still um today is the way that she uh thinks up new dishes so she first cooks them from start to finish 
in, in total detail in her mind. And I think it's, uh, I don't know, I don't, I've never heard anything like this. I don't know if you have, but I certainly haven't. And so, she's, you know. She's an incredibly yeah. genius. Yeah, totally. Um, so what do you think? I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Here we have, in the meantime, I'm making this little mountain. I hope this cutting board is big enough, but um, I'm sifting together the flowers and a pinch of salt. Um, this is the chestnut flower and a little bit of all-purpose flour. And I'm sifting them over the uh, riced potatoes or the mm -hmm. mashed potatoes or however you're, you're doing it. Um, and this again is just to kind of avoid lumps and make sure that everything comes out light and fluffy and delicious. And um, then I'm going to knead it together and shape them. Basically. So. I'm gonna tilt it. Is mm -hmm. this better? Because I, I noticed someone commenting, is it possible to lower the camera? Yes. Is this, I hope this is better. <laughs> It looks like a Monte Bianco. I know, it's dessert. like a beautiful mountain and I'm really right. realizing this um, cutting board is a little small, so it's gonna be a little bit, I, it's gonna be interesting, but we can, we can do it. I think we can see it. Yeah. Like this, yeah. I think. Yeah. Much better, much thank you. Okay, perfect. Much to see right so now. I'm gonna, you know, don't worry. I'm gonna, okay. fit, this is- I'm probably gonna the get degree. this all over my computer. This is because... the degree of my assistance. And right. Basically, I'm tilting the computer. Okay. But she doesn't need any assistance. Right, except with this tiny cutting board. So, um, you know, an important thing with gnocchi, all gnocchi, is not to overwork the dough. Yep. So what we want to do is just mix it just enough. There went some on the floor, but not a problem. Uh, we're going to mix it just enough to where everything comes together, but we don't really want to knead it. And there is no eggs in this gnocchi recipe. Mm. I tried very, very many. Some people do use eggs, some people don't, but you know, the chestnut flour is really hearty, you know, and it has enough right. structure to it that you really don't yeah. need the egg. Yeah. I do add a little bit of olive oil to um, bind it all together, but I'll do that once it's a little bit <laughs> more needed. So while you keep doing that, let's talk about how um, primi are really having a moment in Italian cuisine, both, you know, family, home cooking and restaurant. And primi are first courses, basically. So all the good stuff, basically. All the good Pasta, stuff. ravioli, risotto, risotto gnocchi, gnocchi totally. everything delicious, all the carbs. Yep. They're definitely having a moment and there's many recipes for, for primi in, in both books. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's amazing how people are finding new, exciting ways to um you know rework the classics at restaurants for instance and how more and more people are approaching these uh, beautiful traditional recipes mm -hmm. that maybe they weren't familiar with before and and really turn into them because as you obviously as you start maybe eating less meat like you said um inevitably what you're gonna do is you're gonna go for you know, 100% uh, vegetable main courses or, 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 or pasta uh, dishes. That, and we have such huge variety. Meantime, as you see, she's, <laughs> she's kneading them, but not really kneading them. No, just more like, squeezing oh, them together. Yeah. That's a whole only Which is sort of like, like you, how you make a pastry crust. Right, exactly. It's the same okay. sort of same sort of thing. You don't want to overwork it. You just want to squeeze yeah. it all together. And make sure that you get the potatoes in there with all the flour. By the way, Laurel makes amazing apple pies and and well, in general pie Right. Crusts. Well, the funny thing is, I mean, this is this Italian book is my <laughs> and my, this Italian food book is my fourth cookbook, but my first one in English and my first one about Italian cuisine because I started writing about food in Italy. And I started writing about American cuisine because when I moved here, nobody really knew that Americans ate anything but hamburgers and hot dogs. And so my my whole career was based on, you know, teaching Italians who were very curious about yeah. what the cuisine of America yeah. was like. Um, teaching them that, you know, we did have a very interesting and very deep food culture. So I love get, the texture. The texture is great. I yeah. mean, it's not the easiest dough to work with. Honestly, it no. is a little bit crumbly. Like I said, this will not be a photogenic dish. It never is. But, but it's um, super delicious. But it's super delicious. It's also a little easier if you let it rest a little bit before shaping yeah. the gnocchi, but yeah. I don't have time for that today. So. so, but as you keep doing that, and mm -hmm. like roughly how many minutes do you think they should keep? 
doing that? Kneading, like I mean, you only need to knead about five minutes. I mean, it really depends on you know, how wet your potatoes are right. and you know, right, right. The flour and the, you just, you want it to come together to where you can then roll it into a right. row. Um, so you just can keep trying. Yep. And then if it doesn't work, you just keep working keep, it. Got it. Okay. Um, so we were talking about creamy having a moment, right? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of pasta dishes, uh, the search for the new cacio e pepe, which obviously will never be surpassed, uh, but mm -hmm. still we're trying it. And, and there's actually very good new pasta dishes being made. And, and rice and risotto are having a fantastic moment. There's a few risotto recipes in my book. Um, lots of work being done with the uh, farming of, uh, you know, the, the, the reintroduction of old varieties of rice, which is also what's happening with wheat. So better flour, better rice grains to work with. Well, again, I think like what you said earlier about, you know, Italian food being very... Sorry, now you're rolling because yes. the texture is right now. <laughs> now I'm rolling, you know, you get a, a little fist-sized chunk and you kind of squeeze it between your hands and make sure that it's staying together. Right. And then you can roll it into a log. Now, the most typical way to make gnocchi, I'm sure you've all seen the YouTube videos and you probably eat gnocchi, is to roll them down the tines of a fork in order to right. shape them. And, you know, I do that when I'm trying to impress people, but honestly, if I'm making gnocchi at home or if I'm making gnocchi for a group of friends or something, I, I never do the right. grooves because they're extremely time consuming and yeah. they really don't make that much of a difference in the long run. In my opinion, I mean, it's, it's one thing if you have some, they always say that it makes the sauce stick on to them better. But I've never had a problem with sauce sticking yeah. to gnocchi in any and case. Plus, in this case, especially with chestnut flour that's so coarse, no? I mean, right. I think it would it would provide uh, enough. Exactly. I'm not uh, sure if that, I'm okay, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you're you're in the shot. Okay. So okay. again, it's gonna be a little cr more crumbly than your typical potato and flour yep. and gnocchi. Okay. But that's okay. They'll yep. stick together then when you cook them. Okay, so now um, so now you just make your little portion. Portions. Yep. Oh, they look lovely. Look lovely. At I'm not sure yes. if you can see the Beautiful. texture in there. Um, if you want to do the, the fork, mm -hmm. the first of all, you have to prepare a fork, which I will do. Um, you want to remember to put some flour on your fork. So this is very important. This is something it. people yeah. don't know. Almost yeah. never. And then you take the gnocco and you just kind of roll it down the fork like that. And then you get your cute little Beautiful. characteristic grooves. I made these a little bit big because I'm looking at the screen while I'm making them. But um, I like gnocchi about this size, honestly. Yeah. People also make gnocchetti, which are the smaller gnocchi that can also be half that size. Again, yeah. it depends what you're going for, the ratio of gnocchi to sauce that you want, and um, you know, just kind of the mouthfeel. But, but I also find that probably for first timers, uh, like when they're making gnocchi for the first time, it's better to keep it, to keep them a bit uh, bigger. No, because bigger, and also that's another reason why I suggest skipping the the fork mm -hmm. the first time around because gnocchi can easily turn into one of those projects that take all day long yeah. and you're angry by the time it's over and everybody's hungry and you're like I didn't think it was going to be this much work and they really should be simple and satisfying you know it's really right. in the time we were sitting here having this conversation you can yeah. make a whole batch of gnocchi yeah. and you just chop them up with the yeah. so I'll keep working on this if you want and it's something fun to make with the kids or like with friends like turn it into like a absolutely a like a project like to... ravioli too yeah, again totally. like if you're making ravioli for a crowd of people yeah. I suggest involving the crowd of people in the yeah. process because otherwise totally. you, will, you will hate everybody by the end of the day yeah. because it's just one of those right absolutely and I suggest you, know, you do the sealing yourself but you make them scoop the filling into the <laughs> onto exactly. the sheet exactly. of the fresh pasta and not the ceiling because that's the tricky part that's the tricky part in the absolutely household. that's also another one of those projects where it's always it seems like it would be a good idea to do with kids but yep. then it's just actually not <laughs> Absolutely. It, doesn't, it doesn't really work. Like you um, it. I'm wondering in the meantime, since we really uh, we're not keeping an eye on, on the chat, if there are any specific questions related to the, the recipe that uh, Laurel is demoing and uh, 
Well, one quick, one quick um, reminder also, when you're making a big batch of this, because I have a whole bunch of dough over here, when you're making a big batch of these, as you finish the gnocchi, put them on a parchment covered baking sheet mm -hmm. with and sprinkle them with a little bit of flour mm -hmm. and don't overlap them. Otherwise, by the time you're ready to cook them, they'll all be stuck together and it'll be really sad. And what are you supposed to do? Like, are you supposed to cover the, the remaining dough while as you're rolling and, and if, making the gnocchi? If, yeah, if you're drying out otherwise? It, it doesn't dry out as much okay. as like pasta dough because right. there's no egg in right. there and right. so I mean it does dry out if you're going to be taking a long time to make all of it you can keep the dough covered with like a damp rag but it's not as urgent as it is with right. like fresh pasta dough when you really if you don't have it right. covered at all times it just right. turns into a hard cakey mess so you were mentioning before that normally you would make it rest though before shipping right yeah resting long... resting helps I mean even 30 minutes oh wow yeah okay. yeah you don't have to rest it for a long time you know about an hour is okay. probably a good amount of time you know and then of course keep it covered right. you can throw it in the fridge but you don't have to you right. can leave it I mean again there's no egg in it it's just flour and potatoes and so. obviously you can make them ahead and then freeze them you right? can make them ahead you mm -hmm. can freeze them you can also again leave them out on the counter you know and right. if it's not too hot out and so and listen um if i were to tell you that like i have a group of friends who are coming this is completely unrehearsed by the way <laughs> watch me ask an impossible question oh no <laughs> <laughs> no but like if i had to you know if i told you that i have a group of friends who are coming for dinner and i would love to like for them to get a sense of what the Gorian cuisine is. Mm -hmm. And I would like for you to cook, you know, a meal for them that really tells the story. Uh, what what dishes would you pick? It can be anything. Okay, let me can go back up to my face because okay. I'm just doing the same thing over okay. and over again. I'm sorry. There you go. Maybe, maybe they miss our faces. Um, <laughs> And what we're not showing is the huge mess I made on the floor here, which I also stepped in already. So I have one big chestnut gnocco under my foot. Um, so and a thing I didn't mention about Ligurian cuisine, which is another characteristic of Ligurian cuisine, is that Ligurians love to stuff everything with something else. So they claim to have invented ravioli. And, and it's a completely unfounded claim. Nobody, <laughs> nobody in like food history science agrees with them, but they're very... They are very proud, um, proud yeah. of the raviolo. They have there's every single kind of ravioli you can imagine. They put you know pumpkin in them. They put meat in them. They put for, foraged vegetables in them. They put fish in them. They put everything. And so that is one example of them stuffing, you know, stuffed pasta, it's perfect. But they also have a famous dish called stuffed lettuce, which is basically Ooh. these lettuce rolls that are, then they're stuffed with um, like egg and Parmesan and breadcrumbs and some meat. And then the, the lettuce is blanched. They're rolled up into these beautiful little packets and they're served in broth. I yeah, love beautiful that. dish. And so that's what you're like, stuffed lettuce. How is that even possible? Wait, we have a photo. Of that. We do have a photo. It. You're going to have to do it because my hands yeah. are. <laughs> it's among the. It's one of my favorite ones, actually. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a pretty picture. It's among the creamy, I believe. No, no, later. Um, so that's another good example of a, of a stuffed uh, dish. Another one is stuffed um, calamari. Mm. Oh, look at okay, this. Okay, yeah, there's the lettuce. Gorgeous. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, I love it. So um, I would say, you know, if you were to make your first Ligurian meal for your friends, I would just, you know, go stuff everything. You know, you can do stuffed anchovies. Another thing that is really big in so Ligurian good. cuisine is anchovies, both the uh, salted preserved kind and the fresh kind. Right. So you could do stuffed anchovies, you could do some kind of raviolo, you could do the stuffed lettuce, you could do the stuffed veal rolls, the tomafele, which are also very, very popular. Um, and dessert, stuffed peaches. Oh, I yeah. love with the uh, with Amarek. yeah with Amarek, they do those there too. They, they do that in a lot of regions so in Italy. With the, like this reminds me of something like we've been having this conversation, Laura and I, about a lot actually. So she has stuffed peaches peaches in her book, and I have a, a beautiful poached pear with a um, um, carob a carob uh, sauce that looks and tastes like chocolate, but it's like carob. Um, and then it's served with this uh, wild mint infused cream. And it's uh, a dish by this duo of brothers, the Montarulli. They have a, a restaurant in Ruvo di Puglia, which is a small town, not far from Bari in Apulia. So it's off the beaten path. It's not in, you know, whitewashed Masseria land, Salento. 
And the crazy thing about the restaurant is that they, they forage everything on this uh, uh, plateau that looks a little bit like uh, the moon and Mars. It's called Murge with this uh, older guy with a huge white mustache riding a Gilera bike with a um, bundle of weed strapped to the back of his bike so that you no longer see his bike plate. But they forage everything and they have it's crazy if you think about it, like a completely vegetarian menu, basically, and they don't serve any pasta in the restaurant, which is in, in super touristy Puglia, land of orecchiette, is insane. Anywhere in Italy, it's unthinkable. Anywhere in Italy. <laughs> yeah. But believe me, it's a super satisfying menu. And, you know, so many of the vegetables that they forage have these, you know, almost medicinal qualities to them. Um, but the way they make these dishes, they're drawn from other traditions of the Mediterranean basin because you know they worked and cooked in uh, Northern Africa, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Spain, and obviously like it's one big culinary family in the Mediterranean. So they mix lots of flavors coming from these cultures too, which is also one of the elements of the new cuisine italiana and I love it. But so their dessert is poached pear and she has stuffed peaches. So restaurant, um, home cooking, Italians really have a very specific approach to desserts. Uh, the world knows a tiramisu and panna cotta, but really we love fruit-based desserts. Well, I think that there's a lot of attention in Italy to the whole to the whole menu. Yeah, and that's something I've really learned to appreciate over here is that when you go to somebody's house, it's they're not they don't want to stuff you too much. Yeah. it's very important for the Italian not to leave feeling pesante, yeah, heavy. Yeah, and so it's very you know when you're creating a menu for people to come over or at a restaurant, Italians are very careful not to make people leave yeah. feeling stuffed. And yeah. so with the dessert, you know, it's rare that at a fine or dining restaurant you would get something like tiramisu for dessert because yeah. You know, it's, it's a hard way to end a meal. <laughs> Especially nowadays, I have to say, because we're transitioning from uh, kind of like an older style of cooking at fine dining, mm -hmm. especially establishments, uh, which was more in, in uh, at, you know, at the pastry station, uh, particularly more maybe French influence where you would have sort of like more constructed, you know, elaborate desserts. Uh, but one of the things that I really like about the new Chantal is that more and more in the past few years, uh, we've, it's, they've given way to these uh, lighter, more refreshing kind of desserts. And, and some of them are simply some beautifully prepared fruit. And why not, right? Like if I, if I had to choose, I, I'd probably have that over, um, the umpteenth panna cotta. I know that it sounds uh, yeah. blasphemous. No, so no, no, it's true. And also just because, again, being an ingredient driven cuisine and the ingredients being so fresh and yes. so delicious yeah. everywhere you go in Italy, you know, they're like, oh, there's this pear that's from this yeah. specific uh, farm right. in this region. Right. You can only right. get it this time of year and you taste right. it and it tastes more like a pear than any pear you've ever had in your life. Absolutely. So I think that also goes into it. I yeah. mean, it's not just any poached pear, it's exactly. that poached pear. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're- Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, yeah, no, no, I'm just... good here. Um, a couple, a couple words about cooking them. Mm -hmm. Again, they're delicate, so you don't want it to be super boiling water. You salt the water, obviously. Um, it's very important to salt the water. Do you want me to take uh, No, I don't think that? we're gonna have time to do okay. the actual cooking. I'm gonna okay. tell them about it. Um, so you salt the water. You don't want it to be a really, really strong rolling boil. You want it to be, uh, you know, a gentle boil because otherwise they'll fall apart. Um, and you just cook them until they float to the surface. So you're going to throw them in, not all at the same time, because otherwise, again, you'll have a big sticky mess. I would maybe do a few handfuls at a time. So, you know, do, do that like two or three times and, and throw them in. And, um, as soon as they float to the surface, you know, count to five, maybe to 10. You, you just have to kind of watch them. It also depends on the size. If you're doing a gnocco this size, you're going to have to count to 10. If you're doing a gnocco this size, you can count to five. And, you know, taste the first ones that come out. You need a slotted spoon to pull them out. Um, you tap it a couple of times and then throw it into the bowl. Um, dress them immediately with a little bit of oil or with the melted butter if you want. If you're doing pesto, um, it's really important always with pesto and I have a whole, you know, chapter about it practically in the book before you dress the pasta, um, to, uh, thin out the pesto with a little bit of the pasta cooking water because pesto is very thick 
thick. It's very dense. And so if you just throw the gnocchi in it, you're not going to be able to stir it. It's going to turn into kind of a glue situation and it's not going to spread easily over the any pasta. So you put the pesto in the bowl first, you thin it out with a little bit of the cooking water. Pro tip. A pro tip, the pasta cooking water, I'm telling you, it, it's, it has so many purposes. It uses for everything. It's, it's like my favorite ingredient yeah. when I'm cooking. And so I always, you know, keep a, keep a little cup of it just in case you never know if maybe your sauce isn't as, you know, slimy as you wanted it to be and you need to thin it out a little bit. So um, those are my tips. And then I, yeah, again, these are delicious, just dressed with Parmesan and butter and sage, you know, classic uh, pairing is also with pesto. Right. So. Um, I saw that I noticed that someone asked um, where we're from originally, though Caitlin, our editor, Caitlin Leffel, uh, replied for us, I'm from Milan and Laura's from Texas. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Texas originally, though I have been in Milan for 17 years. So it's been, it's been a piece. Okay. Um, so I wonder if there are any questions. First of all, I hope you know, we hope you enjoyed the, the chat. I hope it was clear and uh, entertaining and then we didn't ramble on too much. Okay. <laughs> it was great. It was great. Yeah. It was so, um, it was so great watching Laurel, watching you make those gnocchi and seeing how you sort of um, dealt with the fact they were getting crumbly and all those things that like when I make it, you know, I'm always like, is this really supposed to be happening? You know, like this is, and so like seeing you sort of like work through that was actually extremely helpful. So thank you. Oh, good, that. good. Really cool. I, I, you know, it's it's funny because I'm sitting down. I, I never <laughs> sitting down <laughs> no, totally. like, on a tiny cutting board. And like, it, so it was, it was a little bit awkward, but no, it is, I mean, all, all gnocchi is like that. And the, the problem with gnocchi is that because you have that panic moment when you're like, oh my God, is this really going to work? People tend to add too much flour yeah, or right. add too much egg, you know, exactly. just trying to like fix it before you even realize you have to have patience. You need a really big workspace to where you can like fold it over. Um, but yeah, you just have to have patience. It will all come together in the end. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, both of you for joining us today. And thank you everyone for tuning in. The books again thank are- Thank you for having us. us. Here we go. I can get them both up here. The new <laughs> Cucina Italiana. Congratulations, both of you, on both of your Thank first books you. in English as well. So, yeah. And Laura, yeah. I think for anybody who's in Italy, you have a bread book coming out soon. Is that what you yeah, said earlier? Yeah, my second bread book. Yeah. And I, my second bread book is coming out in Italian for now, but who knows in the future? It's coming out. Yeah. Six. Yes. Let's hope uh, it gets an English translation. That'd be great. Yes. yes. Laura is also an incredible bread guru and um <laughs> makes incredible loaves of bread so if you follow her on instagram you can <laughs> see all of her bread porn it's amazing <laughs> oh, very good <laughs> at this point so yes <laughs> no i love it well good luck with the new book as well thank you again both of you have a lovely evening thank you, thank you thank everyone you. for tuning day. in yeah thank you everyone Thanks for tuning everybody in. everybody for coming thank you thank, thank you. you for having us bye bye, bye. bye. you're gonna have to close